Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Doug Holder, and I'm here with my guest, uh, Joyce Pesseroff. How are you doing? It's a Very good day. Good. Thank you, Doug. Um, Joyce, this is a relatively new book, Know Thyself. Yes, uh, it came out a year ago in October. A year ago in October. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll read you a brief introduction to Joyce Pesseroff. She's the author of five books of poems and the editor of three additional collections. She received grants from the Massachusetts Artists Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts. She is a distinguished lecturer at the University of Massachusetts, where she directed the M MFA program uh, for, for its first four years. Okay. So I was going to ask you, uh, you know, um, my family's from the Bronx. You grew up in the Bronx. I know a lot of great writers like Cynthia Ozak uh, was in the Bronx. Do you think there's a certain sensibility of a Bronx writer? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, certainly in my first books, I wrote a lot about growing up in New York City. Okay. And there's a certain awareness, I think, awareness of your surroundings when you grow up in New York that you never lose. Um, you're always aware of the people around you. You're aware of the interactions between people. And you're also aware of um, the way that the landscape is dominated by things that are made by humans. Okay. So you, you think um, sort of like, and you're a walker, like Kazan's walker in the city, you're taking in everything, or even Whitman, just like sort of taking in and so much you know, so much variety and things like that. Yeah. Yes, and uh, one of the things that I like to write about is contrast and the tension between um, both the outer world and the inner world and the sorts of juxtapositions that you see on a city street that maybe you're less likely to see in a suburb. Most definitely. Now, um, um, I was going to say, you, you were involved with the great uh, collective... Uh, was it more women than I know Ron Schreiber was in it, yes. but, uh, but it was basically more women. Alice it was the James Alice James books. books. Yes. Tell us about that. Um, it was a cooperative with an emphasis on publishing poetry by women, but in fact, uh, Lee mm. Rudolph, as well as Ron Schreiber, mm. were among the first uh, founding members of the I cooperative. I studied under Schreiber. Yes, uh, yeah. yes. He yeah. was at UMass Boston. That's too. what I was saying. Yeah, it was, yeah. I, I took a graduate course in gay literature. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he was a wonderful presence. Yeah. Um, but the cooperative was really founded to fill a gap um, for women writers who weren't finding much of an opening with traditional publishers. Who were the women writers uh, that? got started there, for uh, instance, we might know. Well, um, Jane Kenyon's first book was published by Alice I James. Yes, uh, From Room to Room came out the year after uh, my book came out. Mm -hmm. in, ni mine came out in 1977, mm -hmm. The Hardness Scale, and Jane's came out in 1978. Um, Celia Gilbert was published by Alice James. Robin Becker's first book was published by Alice James. Um, Kathy Aguero was a member of the cooperative. And um, one of the first books that I think of in contemporary, say, post-World War II poetry that was a verse biography was written by Ruth Whitman called Tamsin Donner, A Woman's Journey. And as a book-length verse bi biography of uh, George Donner's wife and a story of the Donner Party, it was among, I think, our best sellers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was among the press's best selling Wonderful. books at the time. So, you were part of this very historic it was really, literary history there. It, it was a piece of literary history. Um, we had our office on uh, Mount Auburn Street in Cambridge, and all of the work was done by members of the cooperative. We uh, did the production, we produced our own. Um, the manuscripts produced to go off to the printer. We brought them to the printer in New Hampshire. We did all of the publicity. We did all of the f all order fulfilling. We wrote the blurbs, uh, not the blurbs, but we wrote. Yeah, um, that would be a one. Right, <laughs> yeah, that would be more Walt yeah. Whitman. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, we we wrote uh, the copy, the advertising copy, uh -huh. and uh, everything was done by the members of the collective. And of course, all decisions were made by consensus, which meant that we would have meetings probably every month, and we'd settle something. And if anybody wanted to bring that 
question up again at a meeting, she could. And then we'd go through the whole thing all over again until everyone was satisfied. Now, um, when did it move to Maine? Oh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, for, it moved to another part of Cambridge, um, yeah. around Porter Square first. But it's been in Maine, I would say, for maybe 20 years. 20 years. Yeah, 15 or 20 years. Yeah. Now, um, now I know you were the first director of the graduate MFA program, and I was yeah. saying we interviewed recently Martha Collins, which yes. was like the first director of the undergraduate creative. I think she helped develop it also. I don't know. Yes, she did. And um, tell about, about you know, the first year there and how it came about. Well, it's, it was unusual because it was something that the um, administration asked for because Martha had developed this wonderful undergraduate creative writing program along with Lloyd Schwartz. Uh, and then we had a creative writing concentration in our MA program. Uh, one of the administration said, why don't we have an MFA program? So Oskold Melnichuk was actually the creative writing director when we had to write the proposal. Was he with Agni for a while? Yes, he yeah. was, yeah. 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 So we wrote the proposal, and it went through governance, and then somebody had to run it. And so the chair of the department asked me if I would do it. And well, who's the director now? Um, Oskold Melnichuk oh, right, right, is right, currently yeah. the di the director yeah. okay. of the program, but it's a it's a three year position. We rotate it among the faculty, and I ended up there for four years because somebody had to start working with it before we actually had students yeah. in the program. So was it was it a tough start? Or? You know, I had a I had a wonderful mentor with the graduate director of the MA program, and a lot of what I did I modeled on what we'd done in the MA program, and we had very strong ideas about the kinds of students we wanted to attract and the kind of program we wanted to have. We wanted what to kind have of a, students? Well, we were looking for a lot of diversity. We were looking for um, people who could be, who were in Boston and we tried to develop a program where somebody could sort of have a job and also finish an MFA without going into a low residency program. So most of our classes were after 4 p.m., uh, everything except the workshop, so people could work that around job and family responsibilities. Um, we, because UMass Boston was known for having among its undergraduates students who are older than the typical student. I think we sort of looked for that with our MFA students too, people who had been out in the world and who had stories to tell, whether in fiction and poetry. We're a small program. We only admit uh, 10 students a year, half in poetry and half in fiction. So there was a lot of cohesion. Everybody knew everybody. Everybody got to know everybody. Um, people shared classes with uh, the MA program as well. So, uh, we in I, I, I yeah. interviewed a, a um, I can't remember, it was Adam Graff. Did you know Yes, him? yeah. Fine, uh, military uh, yeah. ex. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. He wrote some more. And I was going to have him at the Newton Free Library. Yeah. He moved with his wife. Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. So he moved. Uh, but, uh, oh, that's great. Okay, so um, you, you were friends with Donald Hall. Yes. Today. Yes. And his late wife, J Jane Kenyon. Yes. In fact, didn't you get Hall to edit Plowshares magazine? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We did um, do it. Henry and I did ask Don to uh, edit an issue of Plowshares. And I interviewed and he you did. with Henry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now, how did, how did you guys meet? And uh, I mean, what were they like as, 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 as poets, friends, and a couple? You know, I mean, <sighs> Well, it's a big question. Yeah, I first met them because uh, I, I got a fellowship to the University of Michigan, which had started a program, uh, and Donald Hall was involved in starting this, uh, modeled on the Harvard Society of Fellows. So they interviewed and invited scholars um, from all disciplines, including writers. And I was interviewed there, and I was accepted into the program, and that's when I became friendly with Don, who he's still had just married yeah, he, yeah, Jane. He yes, he's uh, he's still living in the farmhouse yeah. in New Hampshire. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And Jane, you met. I met through him. Jane through him. They were married then, and we started because they would have sort of an informal workshop. And Greg Orr was also 
a fellow there. And so occasionally Greg and I and Don and Jane and some other writers too who are students at Michigan would get together and we'd share poems. And uh, we, we were there for two years and uh, then at the same time I came back to Massachusetts, Don and Jane ended up moving to New Hampshire. Don bought the family farmhouse and I might have been the only person Jane knew within a hundred miles uh, mm. from her Ann Arbor days. So we definitely kept up our friendship. I would drive up <coughs> to the farmhouse. I had this little Volkswagen bug. And after 80 miles on that road, I'd step out of the car and I'd still be vibrating. Wow. And, uh, but we would, we would spend time together up there. She would come down to Cambridge to go to the Grolier. We'd do that together. And we were editing a little magazine at the time what called Green, was that? it was called Greenhouse. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah so we were we were working on that as well. You know, a friend of mine, the poet Dennis Daly, yes. said he was on I was yes. just talking uh -huh. and he said he was on the front cover. He was, yes, he was. Yeah. Yes. He's still around, you know, he's in yes, the Vega bars. He does a I lot of the reviews. That. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. yeah, he uh he was one of our, our people that we published and we put them together the magazine because we wanted a place where we could feature pe uh, poets who you wouldn't maybe always see together, people with different aesthetic approaches different and sensibilities. different sensibilities. Um, you know, and we also kept an eye out. We wanted to have a balance um, between men and women, between the pages. And uh, so that was one of the reasons we thought we wanted to start a literary magazine. It's interesting that now I think people uh, who do that would do it online rather than do it in print. Yeah, the problem is, you know, with a lot of online magazines, they don't keep, if they go off, they don't keep right, archives. I always right. still like yeah. print because there's some yeah. solid. Yeah, there's always something there. Yeah, I mean, how about if, like, you know, it's a solar flare and the whole thing right, goes down right. to the Russians. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Something about the print. Um, and um, so you, um, you, you know, in your poetry that I've read in, in your new collection, um, Know Thyself, um, you often... Um, the pair lightness with darkness, and then it seems to me that you're always looking over your shoulder. Is that uh, yes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's because I grew up in the Bronx. That's right. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> yes, I, I, I guess I, I feel that um, you know the world is a surprising place, and you never know so you're not what it's going weary. to come from. Oh no! Oh, okay. certainly not. Certainly not. It's still. Uh, Full yeah. of surprises, yeah. both good and, and bad, uh, unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I think uh, you know part of the ways that I've, I've developed as a writer um, from my first poems is uh, maybe a, a little more sideways look at those things rather than more of a head-on approach. Mm -hmm. How do you mean? Well, um, I guess sort of thinking of uh, Emily Dickinson, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Yeah. And, and maybe I've become a little more uh, interested in, in, in the slant okay. um, and, and how that can encompass what our experience is. Because very often our experiences aren't, uh, they're subtle. They're not um, something that you approach and immediately uh, have a single reaction to. In retrospect, maybe you do. Yeah, yeah, but but even in retrospect, you start thinking of all the nuance. So I, I think I try trying to get more of that um, into a, a poem. So so know thyself, I think, is a question uh, which maybe doesn't get fully answered. Okay. In this well, I mean book. that's taken from the Greek, right? You said in the poem that yes, the Greek, exactly, exactly. And you want to have the, like the middle ground between animal and God. Exactly. I was going to ask you about that. What? Uh, tell me about that. That. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that they're saying that uh, you should, you know, you you have things that you want and you desire, but you should actually be there in the moment. It seems to me, um, and experience what's there and available. Yes, and, yeah. and I think also that uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a moral precept, too, and don't try to act like a god because you're not, but you're not an animal either, and to find that middle ground. Wait a minute, that sounds like someone we know. Yeah. <laughs> god and animal. Who acts like a god and is an animal. I don't know who that is. All right. But... Uh, 
but I think that it's a very hard thing to figure out because uh, um, uh, part of the, the transcendentalist idea was that we all have a divine spark within us. We're not God, but there's something of that within us. And certainly we know we are animals, and so we have that within us. So how do you figure that one out? Um, it seems like a simple a, a, a simple thing to uh, to describe, but I think it's more complicated. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to be having, um, and I know my late father. Uh, it's sort of like an ongoing conversation, you know. And and I've noticed that in your work, mm -hmm. you're talking to your mother and things yes, like that. Yes, yeah. And she's always a presence there. Maybe you could expand on that. Well, um, I lost my parents. I lost both of my parents within four years. Okay. And I think my my sort of tendency towards towards elegy and exploring grief began in an earlier book, um, Mortal Education, which I, know, I wrote a lot of poems about Jane Kenyon's death there. And part of what you do, I think, when you write about people who are gone is you it's an attempt to keep them alive and uh, do you actually ever feel their physical presence like, like I you? have in dreams yeah. Yeah. I've had in dreams I haven't had it in waking life but I've certainly felt that in dreams in dreams and I can remember feeling heartbroken waking up and realizing well that was a dream you are not going to see these people again right but maybe yeah. you did who knows it's true. Sweet it's true. Well, right? It's true. Well, I want to give you um, some time to um, read from your work, uh, Know Thyself, which I guess is available in all bookstores and Amazon it's, and all that stuff. Yes, so. and, and from uh, University Press of New England, who distributes it for Carnegie Mellon. Um, did you have anything in particular you were interested in hearing? Uh, no, I'll let you okay. decide. There was a lot of good stuff. Okay. I mean, I like the... the uh, three-part poem, um, I forget the name of that, about your daughter and your, um, and your, I think it was the loss of your mother, was a three-part one. Uh, is it three questions? Yeah, that's yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, why don't I read that? Okay. Um, three questions. One, where's my cancer? Everyone's got it. Blood, lymph, brain, prostate. Will it be rare? Or common, liver, breast, colon. Will I be cut? Chemo, radiation. Wait and see how much treatment, how deductible from my years. Where is it? Skin, bone, tongue, cervix. Last egg in my ovary. When they find it because I'm tired, bleeding, easily bruised, Will they ration my cure? Two. Will I scatter you with a sewing motion like salt in the woods? Barren meadow, lake we loved. I'm alone with whispering friends, their fruit sweetening baskets. When I hallucinate, you run in place calling me to join, please, lacing my sneakers, all wanting spoiled. I can't. Three, elusive particle may or may not exist once in a trillion years. What were the odds to make you my daughter? A super collider under my belly, multiplying matter from darkness. Your natal hair slicking my thighs. Maybe you don't want a universe at risk. Maybe lose all mother and father now. You lost your daughter? No, 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 oh. no. No, I'm thinking maybe she doesn't want to have kids. So oh, far she hasn't. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> so, no, no, it's it's uh maybe you don't you don't want this yeah. world of risk. And I haven't lost my husband either. Which oh, okay. is, it's just okay, it's it's morbid. I'm sorry, I don't want to morbid knock off your whole morbid family. uh right. <laughs> <laughs> morbid uh imaginings um about the future. Um 
Maybe I'll read this poem, the facing poem, which is about Jane Kenyon and about um, something that I read in uh, Megan Marshall's um, biography oh, all right, yeah. of um, you know the, the transcendentalist. Right, uh, right, right. And she won the Pulitzer. Didn't yes, she? she did. Yes, yeah. she did. And uh, there's a quote here from um, uh, uh, Sophia Hawthorne, who um, s wrote about Margaret Fuller, saying that maybe it was uh, a mercy that she drowned. Italian nobody. When Jane died, I thought, so many things hurt her. A beggar on the grate, two stones grinding an ear of wheat. I meant, I can't stand that she's dead, so I'll pretend it's for the best. She loved Keats, Motown, dime stores, a full bag of suet, kneading bread, baking it in metal lengths of rain gutters to perfect French loaves, more than I did. And I'm on the porch by a lake reading a life of Margaret Fuller, whose friend wrote, it was a mercy she drowned in sight of land, rather than live with her Italian nobody and their baby boy. Somebody asked uh, Megan Marshall what she made of that, and Megan said she thought that Sophia felt that it, it was so uh, so awful that she really couldn't stand that her friend was dead, that she pretended that, well, it must have been for the best. Um, here's something a little lighter. All right. <laughs> this was actually um, part of the program that uh, the uh, Mass Poetry uh, did, putting uh, poems on public transportation. Oh, we this did was you on a, a bus. Yes, That's, this that poem. Got a great readership, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so this poem was and for on a the bus. Also. Yes, yeah. yes, it, it really worked together, um, and it, it was called. Uh, it is called your ad here. Hey, would you consider buying ad space in this poem? Mm -hmm. Everyone's getting shot lately. Door to door is a risky business. Sample cases get heavy. And, as with poetry, if you stop believing your own patter, no one will. Quarter page can be top or bottom. Right, left. Half page, the footnote to a brilliant and moving conclusion. Four colors good, black and white better. A bleed to the margins appealing to readers 30 through 69. If posted on a blog, the pitch lives forever. If the product's essential as a nursing bra or headlamp, ditto the poem. One hand washes the other, post back scratch. Imagine a moving and brilliant conclusion. And looked and looked our infant side away. Or its bright, unequivocal eye. With your ad here. So those last two quotations, uh, the first was from Elizabeth Bishop and the okay. second was from Jane Kenyon. I remember Kathleen Spivak wrote a poem about playing ping pong. She used to play ping pong with uh, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth Bishop. I bet she was. You know, I bet she was an incredible player. She was good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Don and Jane used to play ping pong. Oh, yeah. Also, they had a ping pong table in their dirt basement. Oh, yeah. And uh, they would. They they had incredible matches. I uh, so. They they share something there. Uh I'm going to read the title poem. Know Thyself. Know Thyself. I'm looking for something I haven't found or caught like a salmon, then released, before knowing it lit up the brain scan of a marine biologist I hadn't met or at a meet, wouldn't recognize as the soul for whom my soul thirsts aura that mixes with my aura 
and a Venn diagram of tides lunging over granite pools to hatch a new constellation of sea stars. Perhaps what I hunger for doesn't exist. The way a cook imagines honey with venison, he stews for a feast when the king must prove his divine right by astounding with fresh creation tongues of well-fed, muttering dukes. In time, they behead the cook, all history the failure of human mercy. In time, the sea ebbs, and starfish harden to a spiny handshake. To the Greeks, know thyself meant you're not an animal or a god. Take the middle path, where stones infiltrate your sandals and violets cower. Who drills in the cave under a sea cliff taps the door to hell. And Still have another two minutes. Have another uh, two-minute poem. Okay. Um, what should I do for two minutes? This is a, a domestic poem called Fly. Fly, right. Fly. A small fly hung around my kitchen mid-October. It didn't buzz. Outside, water shape-shifted from flakes to drops. Knock-knock of rain, the who's there of snow. The fly tiptoed on the pink cutting board, I aimed to smash it like a head of garlic. It bounced from ceiling to wall, restless aviator, little boy trapped in a balloon that was a hoax. Was it my mother's perturbed spirit warning me that blood stains? Of course not. Last of its kind, Robinson Crusoe landing on a kitchen island. The fly needed to be warm. So, Joyce, are you going to be reading anywhere soon? Um, I don't have anything scheduled here. I'm going to be I'm going to be in Florida uh, for the winter, and I am doing something. If anyone's down in Fort Myers, you ever Myers, run into Miriam Levine down there? No, I no, haven't. She, she goes yeah. down there. Every, Does she yeah. go down there? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. If anybody's going to be in uh, Fort Myers, I'm going to be reading on uh, January 12th at the Arts Alliance there. So, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. How is Florida? Is that so? You like it you know, uh, culturally. It's, it's, uh, culturally, it's it's a little. Um, it's it's nothing to compare to Boston. Right. No, the weather is compar is uh, yeah. good. Good. Yeah. And uh, you have a website, yeah. Joyce Pesseroff. Joyce Pesseroff dot com. Um, I blog on the site, and um, I do a lot of book reviews, and especially uh, small presses, books of poetry. So okay. that's what you can see there. Thank you very much, Joyce. Well, thank you, Doug. It was really a pleasure chatting with you.